Hi. This lesson is all about these amazing organisms, the trilobites. Arguably, perhaps the first uh, successful complex life form that we saw uh, here on Earth. It's a group of animals that uh, were incredibly diverse. And we find, even within the rocks uh, here in Wales, uh, the area around Bilth, for example, or St. David's, um, are quite famous for their uh, trilobite fossils. What I want to do today is I want to, us to think about the evidence we find for how these trilobites actually lived. And to uh, look at some examples of these different trilobites and think about how their um, fossil remains perhaps give us clues about the life that they led uh, back in the early Paleozoic. Now for this lesson, uh, you need a handout that has images of the different types of trilobites on it. Uh, annotate these images uh, as we're going through the lesson. Okay, let's go. If we think a little bit about the geological history of the trilobites. They were an early part of the Cambrian explosion. Um, this uh, radiation of life, uh, in particular uh, complex invertebrate, um, hard-bodied organisms that evolved uh, very rapidly at that time. They also act as the most important zone fossils, the fossils that we use to date um, events during the Cambrian period. They evolved rapidly and became very diverse and achieved their peak diversity towards the end of the Cambrian period and into the early Ordovician. Since then, it's a, a story of decline for the trilobites. The, by the end of the Ordovician, they were in a, a long-term decline, which continued right the way through the uh, Carboniferous and Permian, and finally the last few surviving examples um, became extinct at the end of the Permian uh, in the mass extinction event that happened then. But really, they, as, as a group, uh, they were of very little uh, importance to the fossil record uh, throughout the, the later parts of the Paleozoic. So we need to think about how trilobites lived. Uh, and we need to think a little bit about what we already know about these fossils. You've done some work already on what the, uh, the different parts of them are. We need to think about how we can work out uh, about where they actually lived and how they lived. Now for this, you need to have watched um, a David Attenborough program called First Life. Uh, the episode called Conquest. Uh, if you want to choose um, the parts, parts three and four uh, of that program, uh, that's from about 19 minutes up to 33 minutes through the program. Although, to be honest, it'd be good to watch the whole of the uh, that particular episode. So if you haven't watched that, go watch that now. If you have, let's think about how we can apply this. Trilobites were one of the first groups to have a hard shell, to be able to mineralize their skeleton. And that gave them some tremendous advantages. Protection from predators, the ability to, to grow to large sizes, the ability to occupy different ecological niches. Now, the trilobites had, their, had this flexible exoskeleton. It did mean as the animals grew, uh, they would need to uh, shed that exoskeleton. The image you can see here is a trilobite that's broken its exoskeleton. Uh, the animal itself, the soft-bodied animal, has crawled out the exoskeleton, uh, probably as modern crabs do, bulked itself up and then um, secreted a new exoskeleton. It does make them very vulnerable for the time it takes them to do that, but it's the only way that uh, they can actually grow. There's lots of different theories about why uh, suddenly in the Cambrian uh, animals were able to uh, mineralize their bodies. Um, 
one of the most interesting is that uh, increased chemical weathering uh, from the continents, the continents which have been building up over geological time, was putting uh, so much calcium into the oceans that organisms that were able to, to use that suddenly became very successful. There are other theories as well. I'm, I'm sure you can uh, uh, look some of those up. So as I say, as they grew, they grew in stages. Um, it's a bit like you know, needing a new pair of shoes. Uh, when you're growing, you get to a point where your feet don't fit into the shoes anymore and you need to get rid of those old shoes and get new ones that are much bigger. And you don't um, tend to buy shoes that are only a tiny bit bigger. You tend to get shoes that are you know, much bit bigger. Uh, you know, room to grow into, as my mum used to say. We see other... Uh, strategies that the trilobites had to protect themselves. We find quite a few fossils where the trilobite is actually rolled up in a way to protect their, uh, their soft underbelly um, from predators or, or other events. Uh, we see the same thing today in, in woodlice, for example. Some of the trilobites had um, a whole series of spines um, coming out of their exoskeleton, some of them really quite ornate. Um, some of the ones, for example, that have been found in Morocco, if you watch the First Life program, you'll see had really quite ornate, quite spectacular uh, spinal structures. Now, they're only going to have evolved um, to protect themselves, to uh, ward off uh, predators that clearly were uh, hunting in the Cambrian Ocean. This is the uh, most famous of the trilobite predators, uh, Anomalocaris. Uh, we find fossils of this uh, from the Burgess Shale, adapted to be a really efficient hunter, fast, able to see uh, the uh, its claws at the front, um, ready to uh, grab prey and push it towards this uh, unusually shaped mouth that it has. Perhaps this is the, the reason why the trilobites evolved uh, such ornate exoskeletons and such protective exoskeletons. We do see other evidence for how uh, trilobites lived. Uh, we do find trace fossils uh, showing how they got round. That underneath their exoskeleton, they had a whole, whole series of, of little fragile legs. They don't preserve very well very often because they are so fragile, but we do find uh, the traces that they left behind in the rocks. Now, trilobites, I think, are fascinating because they are a very extinct group. They've been extinct for uh, over 250 million years. There are some rough modern analogies. These are the horseshoe crabs that are often um, given as, a, if you like, a, a modern analogy. But I think there are some, there are some big differences here. Uh, really to understand the trilobites we need to look carefully at the exoskeletons that they uh, evolved to be able to um, occupy the ecological niches that they did. Let's look at some examples. Um, this is uh, Diphon. Um, this is a, uh, a quite small trilobite that actually doesn't have a complete exoskeleton. So the um, soft parts of this bod the body of this animal would have been exposed. Um, but we think this one, because of its streamlined shape, because of its lightweight shell, must have been uh, a, a swimmer. Um, proper name for that is it, it's nectonic. Um, it's glabella, the, the middle part of the kephalon there, uh, is, is very large compared to the rest of the animal. That could have held uh, some oil, perhaps, uh, like a um, you know, sperm whale, uh, to give it buoyancy. So you know, we're, we're starting to interpret what these animals are like from uh, just what we see in the shells. If you look at Agnostus, um, this is uh, quite an early trilobite. Uh, they're really very small, uh, from top to bottom, from kephalon to pygidium, 
uh, less than a centimetre, uh, and they were blind. Um, but they were quite lightweight. They didn't seem to articulate very much. There's only a couple of thoracic segments. Um, and they, they do occur in large numbers. These ones are thought to be what we call planktonic or pelagic. They floated around in the sea. Perhaps they weren't able to even uh, move themselves around and they were um, at the mercy of any uh, currents that were in the sea. This is a very famous trilobite. Uh, this is um, Trinucleus. Uh, now, Trinucleus uh, is another small, blind um, trilobite. Uh, like a small disc shape. Uh, the sort of main part of the body uh, is sort of about the size of a, of a 1p coin, I suppose. Because of its, uh, its small, flat, disc-like shape, because of the fact that it was blind, this is uh, interpreted as, as a burrower, perhaps. Um, or certainly in deep water, where the sight was of no advantage. What's quite intriguing about a, a trinucleus, though, is uh, this big, what we call, cephalic fringe. This big um, part of the shell around the cephalon. Now, there's been all sorts of different um, theories about the, the function of this, whether it's to spread its weight over some very soft mud, whether it was used as almost like a spade uh, to dig its way through um, the sediment, whether it's uh, these, these pits... Uh, that were on it were some type of sensory function. Um, there were long spines that came back off this uh, this fringe. We call them genal spines. Um, what were they for? You know, was that again to distribute weight? It seems unlikely they were for defence. It's a fascinating little uh, little fossil. What do you think that uh, the function of these features were? They clearly must have had some function. It must have been something which. Uh, drove the evolution of these features. This is Paradoxides. Um, Paradoxides, uh, we think, uh, was what we call benthonic, or bottom dwelling. Mm -hmm. So it crawled around uh, on the sea floor. Um, this one has eyes, so clearly uh, being able to see was uh, an important uh, for this fossil. So it was in a, uh, a zone where there was light. Um, it had, again, like trinucleus, this large um, cephalic fringe and genal spines, uh, perhaps to spread its weight over over soft mud. The pachydium here is, is very small, perhaps not wasn't used for pushing itself around in the water. Um, so it, it does sort of suggest, uh, particularly with the eyes on the top of the head, uh, that it was it was deep down, it was low down in the water column, uh, and looking up, looking around it for um, predators. This is a, a, a really unusual one, um, Neoacephus. Um, if you look at the eyes here, growing out on these long stalks, clearly. There's got to be some advantage to that. There's got to be something that that's allowing it to do. Um, the interpretation of this is that this animal could crawl around actually just under the surface of the seabed um, with its eyes then poking out at the top, watching out for uh, for potentially any danger. Again, if you look at the, the shape of the body here, it's quite sort of disc-shaped. It's quite flat uh, and relatively smooth which again perhaps suggests it did push itself through the mud. This particular um, trilobite that David Attenborough is discussing uh, in the programme uh, is perhaps the most remarkable of all. The eyes uh, on this animal are just astonishing. 500 lenses. The ability then to detect movement very, very accurately, very, very um, sensitive to, to movement around it. Um, 
the, the, the sun shades at the top uh, with you know such incredible per peripheral vision. Um, I, I find personally, I find these things um, astonishing. Um, they have been interpreted as living uh, in sort of shallow water, so you know where sunlight would have been an issue for these things. Uh, and, but also the ability to detect uh, the wider diversity of life that would have been would have existed in uh, these sort of shallow uh, tropical seas. Um, yeah, I, I just I, I never cease to be astonished by these. Things. And then there are some like Wallacerops, uh, one of the Moroccan uh, trilobites with quite a spectacular array of spines. But then this uh, trident poking well out in front of its cephalop. What do you think this could have been used for? It seems unlikely to be used for defence. Was it sentry? Was it used for protection? Was it a uh, horn like a beetle today? Uh, this is an animal that did have eyes. Is it, is it just is it a display to attract mates? Who knows? What do you think? It's probably uh, uh, benthonic. Probably crawled along the seabed. But I don't know. It's a, it's a it's an interesting one. Here's two more with some really quite distinctive uh, features on their exoskeletons. What do you think? I'm not going to tell you the interpretation of these. I want you to uh, look at some of these features and see if you can work out uh, or come up with a really good interpretation of how you feel these animals live. So, don't have nightmares about these. Don't succumb to the trial by terrors. But we should think about some conclusions here. This is the uh, the trial by wilderness area in California at sunset. These animals are incredibly diverse. The range of adaptations they have are um, almost mind-boggling. What it does mean, though, is as geologists, we need to try and understand the function of those adaptations. They wouldn't have just happened you know, for, for no reason. There's got to be uh, some external factors driving those the success of those particular adaptations. What makes trial bites um, particularly fascinating, I feel, is the fact they're extinct. The fact we don't have uh, the modern analogy that we do say, with, particularly with bivalves and also with brachiopods, that we can um, interpret these uh, adaptations uh, in the light of what we see in modern examples of those species. With trilobites, we've got, we're one step removed. We need to think about what the function of these might be. We need to be perhaps a bit more creative in our interpretations. Now, I need to, we need to have a go at this. We need to uh, work on a study task to see if the, uh, we can interpret these things. But that's for another lesson. I'll see you then.